I'm very pleased to be here, and I, I uh, appreciate this opportunity. It's actually, I was just thinking this as I was scribbling some notes. Uh, this is the first time that I've uh, had the opportunity to really tell the whole story as an overview right up to the moment of the election that's taking place this Sunday. Uh, uh, so I really appreciate the chance to think this through. Um, and I, I want to, in terms of er Eric's point about me having spent a lot of time there, uh, obviously I'm not Greek, uh, but uh, I think Eric will agree with me on this, largely thanks to our graduate students. We sometimes get entrees to the most interesting things uh, by virtue of what our graduate students are doing. And in my case, Hi. how's it going? How are you? Good. Sorry to be late. A fellow Torontonian. Um, didn't know you were here. Um, uh, in my case, uh, I returned from my first visit in Greece uh, in 1979. Uh, having fallen in love with the country, um, I was on a sabbatical in London and spent a few weeks with my wife and children uh, in Greece, and uh, it just seemed like I should have been born there, culturally, politically, a highly politicized society, etc. And came back uh, after my sabbatical, and there was a Greek PhD student who had appeared at Carleton, admitted to the program, to come to work with me, because of the work I had done on political parties, uh, to do a PhD thesis on PASOK, which had just been elected that year, uh, led by Andreas Papandreou, who, uh, of course, had spent much of the junta years as an economist at York University. Uh, my barber, still uh, Gus the Barber, as he's known, in Toronto, uh, still uh, takes pride in the fact that he played the accordion at Papandreou rallies when he was living in Toronto during the hunt. Um, uh, well, as it turned out, this PhD student, uh, Michailis Bordalakis, who is now one of Greece's most famous political scientists, dean of the School of Economics and Political Science, uh, went on to do a PhD with me on the failure of Pesach which became a book. Uh, so I, and I mean, he became a very close friend. I was best man at his wedding, and Greeks will know that being a best man at somebody's wedding means you become for the rest of their lives something like a godfather. Uh, beyond that, because I worked on Marx's theory of the state so much, and Nikos Poulantzas was not only Greek, but uh, a member of the Greek Communist Party of the Interior, which had broken with the Soviet example in, 1938, in, 19, in 1968. Uh, because of that connection, uh, I also had invitations from time to time uh, to Greece to speak on the theory of the state, on Poulantzas, and so on. At one of those in 1998, actually at a conference commemorating the 20th anniversary of Poulantzas' death, he committed suicide as a young man in the mid-40s. I think it's astonishing, really, when one thinks of that, since I'm convinced, not being a Pulanzasian, never having been, I think, a bit even unlike Eric, uh, a Marxist structuralist, uh, I think Pulanzas is probably the one political theorist of uh, our time who will be read two, three, four centuries from now. Um, I remember at one of these conferences being introduced to give a keynote address by the Prime Minister of Greece, Kostas Simitis, who told the story in introducing me that he and, and Nikos Balantzas were schoolboys together, and they used to walk to school arguing, and at that point, Simitis was the Marxist. Uh, when he was Prime Minister, a Pesach Prime Minister, he was a social democratic modernizer to the core. Um, actually crucial to getting uh, uh, Greece into the Euro, uh, with all of that it eventually entailed. Uh, at that time, in the late 90s, uh, the core party that uh, gave rise to Syriza, the coalition of the radical left, 
and remains the core grouping uh, in Syriza uh, today, uh, was uh, a confused Eurocommunist party, which was admirable uh, in so far as uh, it had reconstructed itself, allied with other elements uh, from uh, the communist left who had broken from the Stalinist orthodoxy, leaving the old, most orthodox uh, elements in what is now, what is the KKE, and is probably the most uh, unreformed uh, uh, orthodox communist party uh, in Europe, if not the world. Um, uh, and a, a various groups had coalesced into Sinus Pisnos, uh, starting with uh, the Communist Party of the Interior, the, the, one of the first Euro Communist Parties, but other elements coming out of the Communist Party, etc., had coalesced in it. But you know, they easily could have ended up looking like the Italian Communist Party did uh, through the 1990s. You know, the Italian Communist Party now is called the Democratic Party, and it's somewhat to the right of your Democratic Party. Uh, uh, but uh, something remarkable happened in the late 90s and beginning of the millennium, and that is some young people from the uh, youth wing of the Communist Party uh, coming out of it during the confusion around the Gorbachev events, uh, perestroika, and so on. By they made a move at the beginning of inside uh, Syriza, in, inside Sinus Pismos, uh, at the beginning of the millennium to link up. Uh, with the anti-globalization movement. Uh, recognize the energy and democratic thrust and substantive significance of that campaign against globalization. And whereas the party had been uh, in the forefront from the late 60s on of being the most Europeanist of the left parties, it remained Europeanist, but because of the anti-globalization element, became somewhat skeptical, Eurosceptic, in terms of the substance of where the European Union was going, in terms of recognizing, to some extent, uh, that, that uh, with the Lisbon Treaty, with the attempted new European Constitution, which was orienting it to becoming completely market-oriented, uh, with European and Monetary Union, as I was saying yesterday, being completely neoliberal, uh, they, they, the party remained, uh, on the whole, uh, oriented to European politics. Indeed, was one of the founding left European parties. There's now a coalition of left European parties. Cyprus ran uh, uh, last year uh, as the uh, leader of the European left parties for the European Parliament. Um, it, so uh, it remained that, that remained its orientation, but nevertheless, it was skeptical with regard to what was the substance of, of the EU now. What, by the time I came there in, 19, in 2008, um, uh, Sinus Pismos had already turned itself into Syriza, this coalition of the radical left. Uh, coalescing with other far-left groups, Maoist groups, some Trotskyists, uh, but, as, but above all, social movements, people from the social movements, uh, into this coalition of the radical left, and it did rather well in the 2007 elections, um, uh, scoring into the teens for the first time in its history. Uh, and when I arrived in 2008, it was at about 15% in the opinion polls, which is quite remarkable for a new left party in the European sphere. And then, uh, just as I was there, uh, a student revolt broke out after a young 16-year-old was killed by the police uh, in a central part of Greece. And not only the universities were closed down, but 500 high schools were closed down. Uh, the Communist Party responded to it by saying this was organized by Jean Provocateurs. Uh, uh, Syriza, by that point already under Tsipras's leadership, having been one of these young people reoriented, he had run for mayor of Athens and gotten a lot of visibility in doing so, uh, uh, threw itself behind the youth revolt. Impressively. In a way that is rare 
for politicians. And it cost us. Uh, the Greek media, for any of you who will know me, uh, can make yesterday's Republican debate look tame. Uh, and and uh, they were vilified for throwing themselves behind the students. And they went down in the polls badly. This helped trigger some divisions in the party, the modernizers still in the party. This is the uh, Greek epithet for Blairites, uh, modernizers. Uh, and they went off and formed uh, a, a small party, which uh, did manage to get some seats eventually uh, uh, under the banner of, of, I think, new democracy, um, or the democratic left, that was it. Um, and Sinas Pismos, uh, the party was still, as an alliance, still made up of all of these factions that had their own organizations. Right? While in this common umbrella organization, and the organization really was run by the old Sinas Pismos staff and organization and apparatus and buildings. Um, uh, Sinas Pismos went off and uh, spent its time leading people in it, writing a 400-page party program. Just as the sky fell in on Greece. Pasok under George Papandreou, Andreas's son, was elected in 2009. Uh, what was immediately revealed, I started talking about this yesterday, was the way in which uh, the Greek government had cooked the books to hide its deficit, uh, but most important, uh, bond investors who had bought Greek bonds at a very di small differential from German bonds because it was assumed that the European Central Bank would underwrite all the bonds of the European states inside the Eurozone. Investors were running away from buying Greek bonds and Greece had a massive deficit, twice as large as it had admitted to until 2009 some 12 or 13 percent of gross domestic product. Uh, uh, and you know, it, it was largely being frozen out of bond markets or if it was able to get bonds at all, right, it was paying uh, an enormous premium. Uh, and the only people even then uh, that were really buying them were the Greek banks, uh, uh, underwritten by uh, the Greek central bank when it could get any, any permission or money out of the European Central Bank to do so. Uh, under those conditions, uh, Papandreou was forced to sign the first memorandum. Uh, and people forget that he wanted to call a referendum before signing it. Uh, in fact, it was at a meeting at the, the G7, which Obama chaired, with Andrea Merkel actually crying at that meeting under the pressure she was under to forgive the Greek debt rather than lend money to the Greeks to pay off the German banks, which the ECB didn't, well, would prefer that, that, that the Greeks be frozen out of the euro. Um, uh, 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 the first memorandum was, the principles of it were arranged. The IMF came to that meeting with a plan for the Greeks to go back to the drachma. It's very interesting that the only institution in the world that had a plan for Greece to go back to the drachma was the IMF. There was nobody in Greece that had such a plan. Uh, in any case, uh, he didn't call the referendum. Uh, uh, he was convinced that uh, appealing to the people in Greece uh, would be a finger in the eye of Europe. Uh, he backed down, signed the memorandum, and this, the history of that is the multiplier effect of the austerity that the Greek government was forced to impose was such that Greek GDP started on a decline that led to its fall by 23 percent, uh, uh, some say even 25, 26 percent, depending on how you're looking at the Greek statistics. This is depression era, uh, uh, depression era phenomenon, much worse than what Greece went through during the Great Depression. Uh, this produced a series of general strikes as people were laid off. 
from unions which are not radical union leaders. The furthest thing from it, many of them are led, most of them are led, by people closely tied to PASOK or even New Democracy, the party. <coughs> Uh, a series of general strikes uh, in, you know, the dozens. Uh, uh, but most significantly to the occupation of the squares right across the country, the Greek Indignados movement uh, in the summer of 2011, uh, and uh, that eventually forced uh, Papandreou's resignation and the imposition of a technocrat government by the Europeans led by uh, Papademos, a former official in the Greek Central Bank, in the European Central Bank, with close ties to the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury, uh, etc. That government didn't last either, and an election was called uh, for the spring of 2012. Uh, Syriza had thrown itself, as it had in the 2008 student revolt, into offering full support for the occupations. <clears throat> Even more important, it had thrown itself into full support for what had spontaneously developed at a local level. Some 400 solidarity networks that were developed across the country to share food, to share pharmaceuticals, to set up psychological clinics and health clinics, given the number of suicides that were taking place in the country. And it threw itself into these. Uh, to the astonishment of the whole leadership of Syriza, since this was not discussed, Cyprus, in the run-up to the election in March 2012, announced on television that he was not, that Syriza was not running in this election to do better, to get a higher score in the polls. And remember, this was a party in 2009 you know, which, you know, had scored, I forget what it was, six or seven percent at most uh, of the vote. Uh, if that, although, you know, it creeped up a little in the opinion polls. Uh, and he said, we're fighting in this uh, election to form a government with whoever will join us. Whoever will join us. This was clearly an invitation to the Communist Party above all. But in any case, it was a, a general call to stop the torture, to stop the torture of the memorandum. Uh, and this changed the political scene. It was like something, had, a light had gone on. And overnight, Syriza shot up in the opinion polls. Passat collapsed completely. Uh, uh, there's now a term in Europe called the Pesachization of Social Democracy, <laughs> uh, which is the hollowing out of the social democratic vote. Um, and in the, in the May election, uh, uh, Syriza scored close to 20% of the vote. New Democracy uh, did not have enough of a majority to form a government. The ele second election was called for Jim, for the end of Jim. Uh, I visited by accident Greece, having been invited months before by a far-left party called Antarsia, uh, which was very much in favor. It gets a minuscule portion of the vote. Uh, it's also a combination of factions, um, uh, Trotskyist, Maoist, etc., uh, uh, but is in favor of pulling out of the Euro and, uh, indeed, out of the European Union. Uh, and has a radical, revolutionary uh, uh, program. Uh, I'd been invited at the same time as Tarek Ali to, uh, to their annual summer uh, school, uh, and I used my time there uh, to get a sense of what was really going on with Syriza, and that seemed to me much more important. I was lucky enough to be invited to attend the presentation of the party program to the Central Committee and the delegates to the Congress, and it was very moving. There were people there old enough to have been involved, or at least have remembered their parents involved, in the Greek Civil War. Uh, and many of them were in tears as the program was presented. And they started chanting, our time has come. Uh, 
I interviewed the main guy who had written this massive party program, the 400 page one for Seamus Pismos, from which the election program was drawn. Uh, an eminent Greek philosopher called Aristides Baltas, that interview is in the 2013 Socialist Register. Um, and he said very soberly, I'm not sure that we should win this election. The Greek state is utterly corrupt. I'm quoting him, corrupt beyond measure. For us to go into it now would involve having to appoint some 10,000 people to try to transform that state. We don't have 10,000 people who are capable cadres, let alone capable of going into the state to do this. That's the first of the dilemmas that Eric asked me to talk about. And then, now he hadn't even addressed this, but when I asked him this question, uh, he understood its significance. I said, well, but if you took the best people out of the party to go into the state to do this, who would be left in the party to do the organizing at the base, which would have to be the mainstay, the grounding of whatever you would do in the state? Oh yeah, he said, that's a good point. Although the fact that it was an afterthought made me think. They did extremely well in that election, as everyone knows. They didn't win, but they got 27 or more percent of the vote. Uh, they elected a large phalanx of members of parliament who immediately decided to give a large portion of their salaries to the Solidarity Networks. Remarkable. Of course, that comes out of the tradition of communist MPs always having kicked back uh, their parliamentary salaries, their legislative salaries to the party or the party branch. But still, it was remarkable. And when there were demonstrations, as the next memorandum was signed by the new democracy government, they walked out of parliament to join those demonstrations. This was a party of a new type, it appeared. Right? Not your normal parliamentary socialist party, social democratic party. They seem to be confirming it was a party of the time. With that success, uh, Syriza <laughs> turned itself not into a coalition any longer of groups, an electoral coalition, uh, really under the umbrella of Sinus Pismos, but into a proper party. And it had its first party congress in uh, the summer of 2013. If you go back, and it's online, and I urge you to read it, um, and look at the 20-page, 30-page political resolution that was passed at that Congress, uh, you'll see a remarkable set of statements, uh, some of which I think are worth uh, briefly reading. Because uh, it gives a sense of what type of party we are dealing with, uh, or were dealing with, uh, some people would say. Uh, for instance, uh, Section 13.1 of uh, that, that uh, uh, political resolution under the heading of our programmatic goals. We will cancel the memoranda and implement and implementing and its implementing laws. We will implement a program of social and economic recovery of productive and environmental reconstruction which will heal the wounds inflicted on the working class and generally restore the conditions of secure employment and decent living with the appropriate wages and pensions creating new jobs. The first step will be the, the restoration of employment relations, collective bargaining, minimum wages, minimum pensions, unemployment benefit, and family allowances to pre-memoranda levels. All collective bargaining legislation had been wiped out under the memoranda. We will not recognize the government's anti-constitutional legal actions that recently led to the suspension of thousands of public servants and the abolition of important public services. In our perception of the public sector as a lever of reconstruction, all the employees that have been laid off are necessary and we're hired back. We will prevent our, col our country from being turned into a debt colony. This is now 13.2. We will renegotiate the loan contracts, cancel their onerous terms, conducting an audit. 
uh, you know, the famous debt audit uh, that so much of the left has been calling for. As was conveyed by our old slogan, no sacrifice for the euro, Syriza's absolute priority is to prevent humanitarian disaster and meet social needs and not to submit ourselves to obligations taken on by others mortgaging the country. We commit ourselves to tackling any possible threats and blackmails from the lenders with all possible means we can mobilize. While well, you're fully prepared with any possible, to deal with any possible development, being certain in such a case, the Greek people will support us. That implies that they would resist the blackmail. That they were not, they were naive about it and they would resist it. Sections 3.8 and 9, we will cancel the planned privatizations and the looting of the public wealth, restore public control on strategically important em enterprises, but at the same time reconstruct them fully. Uh, those that have been privatized or are under privatization so as to form a powerful, productive, efficient, and open to cooperation public sector of a new type. Uh, I think that's probably enough of that. And then, uh, most, perhaps most important from my perspective, in terms of the question uh, of finally breaking with the ultra-revolutionary dual power notion of smashing the state and building a power outside of it, but of learning how to democratize the state, to transform the state, which is what Pulantzas was above all getting at in his last writings. We will radically change the way public services and local authorities operate, establishing democracy, decentralization, transparency, and meritocracy, regardless of ideology or public opinion, relentlessly cracking down on corruption, vested interests, partisanship, and bribery. We will introduce the concept and practice of democratic planning and social control on all levels of central and local government. We'll re we will reassess the administrative structure on a regional municipal level and ensure, it sounds like Joel uh, uh, is writing this, doesn't it? And ensure that regions and municipalities will get the necessary funds to exercise their social role and contribute to the economy's growth. We will also establish permanent and stable employment relations at those levels. It concludes, however, <clears throat> this is what's really astonishing, it's a long four-paragraph conclusion, but the central paragraph is, the state we are in today calls for something more than a programmatic framework, even something more than a complete for program formed democratically and collectively. It calls for the creation and expression of the widest possible militant and catalytic, catalytic political movement of multidimensional subversion. Hmm. I'm laughing, but where have you seen this coming from a political party calling for multidimensional subversion that will operate in a spirit of utmost solidarity, elation and inspiration, a movement that will bring closer together and mobilize hundreds of thousands of people. Only such a movement can lead to a government of the left and only such a movement can safeguard the course of such a government. A government of the left has a specific expectation horizon. It carries out radical reforms, takes on development initiatives of a clear environmental and class orientation, opens up new potentials and opportunities for popular intervention, helps the creation of new forms of popular expression and claims. However, it cannot realize the great changes this country really urgently needs all by itself. For a government of the left, a parliamentary majority, whatever its size, is not enough. It cannot proceed as if it was just a matter of delegation. Taking account of these facts, Syriza has shouldered the responsibility to contribute decisively to shaping this great movement of subversion that will lead the country to a new popular democratic and radical changeover. Very heady stuff. This is not the language of social democracy. It's not even the language just of post-war social democracy. It's not the language of second international social democracy. In some ways, you could say, given its, the clarity of its democratic thrust in terms of democratizing the state, 
It's not even the language of the first or third international. So there's a lot to get excited about. That said, that said, the Congress hardly discussed this. There was no debate on this. You know, that conclusion was probably written by the philosopher Baltas, who I interviewed. He's, he, he's poetic. He's romantic. The Congress was devoted to faction fighting over what procedures would be to retain the standings of the factions within the new party frame. Uh, the, quote, if, if you like, the left opposition coalesced around a grouping called the left platform, which is in favor of pulling out of the euro. The majority coalesced around Cyprus and the parliamentary leadership. Uh, but there were plenty of other factions maneuvering for place. The old Maoists, some of them were very, very creative political organizers. Uh, a lot of whom were close to Cyprus now in handling his international relations and so on. But it was mainly procedural, organizational matters that concerned the delegates. Right? Not even strategic ones so much. When I was there next, having been invited by the Pulansas Institute to a last-minute conference organized in March 2014 in the run-up to the European parliamentary elections in which Cyprus was heading the ticket. <clears throat> and they were trying to show that they were capable of being a respectable government, although a radical one. Uh, I don't know why I got invited, but the former finance minister, minister of Iceland uh, a, a, uh, a Green in the Iceland coalition was invited to show how they had handled the Iceland uh, debt crisis. And many people from the German left party who had been in government, in coalition governments, at the Lander, the regional, or at the local level were invited. Uh, and these were people with ministerial experience to show that they were serious. Nevertheless, I was on panels with Dragasakis, the old communist leader, who in fact had gone into a national unity government in 1990 and was often suspected, or highly suspected by more radical members of Syriza uh, for that reason, uh, and Cyprus himself. And I came to the conclusion then uh, that uh, this leadership would only go as far as the Europeans would let it. That's not to say that they weren't going to push very, very hard. But it was clear to me they were only going to go as far as the Europeans would let them go. And I don't think that one should uh, you know, be uh, all too critical of this. I think one should just note it. It has to do with an emotional, almost psychological attachment to being European. Greeks do not want to be seen as part of the Balkans. Maybe it's part of their racism. Uh, but they have experienced enough racism from Northern Europe in the last five years on lazy Greeks and lazy Southerners to fill anybody's stomach to the full. Certainly it has to do with seeing themselves as the fount of Western civilization and democracy, with good reason. Uh, uh, it has a lot to do with tactical and electoral considerations. Antarcia, after all, got less than 1% of the vote in the previous election. And all opinion polls and any canvassing that anyone can do just of a normal nature, talking to people in Greece, <coughs> shows the extent to which they, at that point at least, even, even under the memoranda, were very reluctant to contemplate getting out of Europe. And it isn't clear what getting out of the euro means. It might mean getting out of Europe. And moreover, and one has to say this, however neoliberal Europe is, the European Court of Justice 
and the image projected and self-image of the European establishment is such that it makes it very hard for a military coup to take place again in any country in the European Union. Not impossible. If the Americans decided it was necessary, it might happen. Uh, but it would be extremely embarrassing and probably juridically very problematic, right? given the autonomy of the European Court of Justice, or quasi-autonomy of it anyway. So you can understand this. You can understand it. And yet, when you press them about, well, but what if right, you come to them saying, we're rejecting the memoranda? Okay. And by this point, Varoufakis' book, which all of you should read, The Global Minotaur, right, was out, 2012. Yukon Sakalatos, who became his deputy in the Ministry of Finance, was already an MP. Andrew Glynn's great student, who I've known for many, many years, right, uh, who's now the finance minister and who signed on to the third memorandum, right, had written his book right, called Crucible of Resistance, Greece as the Crucible of Resistance. Both of them did a brilliant dissection of the irrationality of European neoliberalism. Right? Uh, but you can see that both of them have no strategic orientation beyond staying in Europe. Varoufakis's proposals are that the European Central Bank should apply quantitative easing to Greece, that there should be a forgiving of the debt, and this is taken on by Cyprus in the Thessalonica program, where they then use the 1953 example of German debt forgiveness that I mentioned yesterday as their model. But above all, that uh, uh, the European Development Bank, which hardly issues no bonds, right, uh, should start issuing bonds backed by the European Central Bank and hand them over to the countries of Europe to do what they want with them. And they would be used in the Greek case for a massive development program, which would also draw on the European subsidies and development funds that every Greek department has become so department of state has become so dependent on, going all the way back since Greece joined the European Union in what 1981. Right? And they do that along with, of course, closing tax loopholes and evasions and ending corruptions. So that's the program. Uh, Tsakalatos, if you read his book, it's a great book, right? But you, say, you see very clearly that what he says is just that. Papandreou did not bargain with the Europeans hard enough or smartly enough, and we will do so. Right? Moreover, it's not just a matter, as he says, provincially of getting Greece off. You can see that both he and Varoufakis are thinking as Europeans in the sense of it's our responsibility to change Europe from a neoliberal Europe. That what we're talking about is breaking European neo neoliberalism through changing uh, the Euro mechanism, through establishing a new Bretton Woods within Europe, whereby su the surplus countries have to, through the ECB, recycle the surplus to the deficit countries inside the Europe. That's the program. That's what's there. Everyone thought Dragasakis would be finance minister. He's also an economist. Varoufakis becomes finance minister. And, you know, he's this incredibly attractive playboy who gets enormous media attention, but as a figure in the party, entirely marginal. Uh, you know, he had never been, he had been an advisor, he had been an advisor to PASOK until 2010. As such, and that was all, all, always true, uh, and I've known him, his work well. He, he was at the University of Sydney. He's very close to James Galbraith and Stuart Holland, who was the author of the uh, Alternative Economic Strategy in Britain in the 1970s. And he very openly presents himself as a Marxist and says, I'd prefer not to be saving capitalism from itself. Right? But the balance of forces in the world is such that let's at least do this. And again, how can one be critical? It was surprising, I think, he was appointed because Dragasakis was such a key figure in the party. Right? But Dragasakis was happy to bind his time as deputy leader, as deputy prime minister. Good. 
one can say they were naive. A lot of people this summer, including people on the street, were saying they were naive. They didn't have a plan B. People who weren't calling for one before. There was a deeper problem, in my view. A deeper problem that the conclusion to the political resolution of the first Congress of Syriza was getting at. The popular mobilizations had cooled off since before the 2012 elections. What had been going on in terms of this tremendous foment from the streets right, had largely cooled off. The Saudi networks remained alive, but there was little evidence, even when I was there in 2012, and this was strongly repeated when I was there uh, in 2014, in the run-up to the European election, there was little evidence that despite the party's support for, for, the social, for the solidarity networks, a lot of support, a lot of party members working in them, that they were drawing the activists in the solidarity networks into the party. In fact, I was told by one very astute cadre, an old Maoist, that he's embarrassed to bring people from the Solidarity Networks to party branch meetings. Because they walk in and there are these fights taking place between the left platform and the Cyprus dogs, as they were known, over plan A versus plan B over what resolution will be supported on this. And you, know, you can recognize this if you've ever been active in a left party. Uh, and how that puts off activists so, from the social movement. And the party wasn't growing at the base. But more problematic, I think, uh, was that this needed to be asked of every element in the party, what they were doing in this respect not just of the party branches and the party machinery at the top, but of the youth wing, who were every day hard at work. You know, and many of them are engineering students, medical students, physics students, not just us revolutionary Marxist sociologists. Right? Uh, hard at work every day, producing pamphlets, posters, organizing meetings, get engaged in competition with the new democracy students, who get most of the votes, by the way, at Greek universities. PASOK students, KKE students, and Tarsia students, and so on. But they, too, were using all of their skills in this tiny network of student elections, of student demonstrations. They weren't out right, doing this kind of organizing right, uh, that that conclusion was reaching for, this multidimensional, catalytic movement of subversion. You know, you don't send the government in Right? Catapult it into the state and leave it there. And there was little evidence that that was being generated by the party. Unfortunately, there was always li also little evidence that this was spontaneously happening from the movements either. So they get elected. It's already the case in the run-up to the election that large elements of the Central Committee, who are Europeanist, who have been strong Cyprus supporters, indeed, including people who came up with him, next to him, the closest to him, as part of that youth wing that turned Sinas Pismos into this very interesting coalition of the radical left. <clears throat> And they recognize that the whole operation is being run out of Cyprus's office. The Central Committee is not being tapped at all. It's being left aside. The party is sitting there. And they form a group called 53 Plus of Central Committee members who write a, a piece to a, a, a letter to Cyprus expressing their concern about this. And it becomes the most organized faction outside of the left platform now in the party, and a number of MPs signed this as well and joined with them. And people like Euclid Sakalatos, who's now finance minister, is a key figure in 53 plus. 
after the election, Cyprus appoints the general secretary, Tassos, from 53 plus, from one of, the, of those members, right? Which, in order to show that he's not alienated from them. It's a minority government. They win. It was inevitable. The question was whether they have a majority or minority. They say that they will form a government with whoever, everybody, whoever will join them. The hidebound Communist Party, of course, will have nothing to do with them. So they form a government uh, with a small group uh, that had broken away from the right, new democracy, a nationalist party, uh, uh, the head of which becomes the new defense minister, and is prepared to sign on to a lot of Syriza's radical policies. Uh, uh, on nationalist grounds. Although Syriza has always presented itself in its Europeanism as not nationalist. Right? Now, certainly it speaks in terms of Greek dignity, quite rightly. Right? And that certainly appeals to a large nationalistic sentiment in Greece. But it is able, in doing so, it, it sucks the air out of the far right which has arisen out of this crisis and taken form in Golden Dawn as an explicitly fascist party. And it sucks the air out of Golden Dawn. Uh, with, without Syriza's rise, who knows where they would be? Look where the National Front now is in France. Uh, so this guy becomes defense minister, although a radical left person is appointed as deputy finance minister someone who has since left the government uh, uh, after the signing of the Third Memorandum. Uh, the leader of the left platform, Lafanzanis, is made energy minister. Varoufakis is finance minister. Uh, uh, and my old friend, the old philosopher, Aristides Baltas, is given the ministry of the largest department in the Greek state, the ministry of education, culture, religion, and sport. <laughs> and since every teacher and every priest in Greece is paid by the state, he's their paymaster. 50% of the appointments, going back to my original discussion with him, go to non series of people. I mean, you have to appoint an army of aides to ministers, uh, but also of uh, capable people who can be brought into new ministries, right? not least since many of those people in senior positions have been there on clientelistic ground, right? much more seriously than the usual appointments from Republicans and Democrats. Right? This is a much deeper clientelism because once they're in there, they stay there in Greece. Right? There isn't this turning around of offices. Uh, I think that those appointments, many of whom uh, were old Pasok people, people who had some respectability in the establishment or amongst the European establishment, as well as technocrats, people who were just experts with have no sympathy, sympathy for this notion of a movement of subversion behind the government. I think that reflected Dragasakis' long-standing strategy. Again, not a discreditable one, given the situation. One that probably harkens back to the old Popular Front strategy of the 1930s that, that so much of the left adopted in the face of fascism. Which is what we need to do is be to be able to draw in behind us as much of the establishment right, as possible if we're going to be able to get anywhere. Right? I think that's been Dragasakis' strategy all along. And he finds some of this notion of mobilizing a movement of subversion blah, as romantic, idealistic, et cetera, et cetera. It, uh, this is the Eric Hobsbawm view of the world. It's how he always regarded the American or British New Left. Uh, it's how he regarded the Benites, the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy. His response to Thatcherism was, we bring everybody to the left of Thatcher into a coalition. And he'd be called out by the Guardian. I think I mentioned this uh, before. Uh, every time there was a Labour Party conference in the late 70s, early 80s, to come out against Tony Benn 
and the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy. And he was doing it on old, he was still in the CP, on old popular frontist kind of grounds. This is the kind of situation we're dealing with here. Okay. The strategy of the government is to secure a bridging arrangement. Because the second memorandum negotiated by the previous government is still in place. There's still payments to be made on debt. All of the memoranda only dribble out the funds that were promised, the billions that were promised, the largest loans in, in IMF history, once you, you know, add in what's coming from uh, the European contribution. Uh, and they're, you know, they would give them out, right, uh, on a bridging way until a new agreement, not a memorandum, could be struck, not with the Troika, but now with the institutions, as they're called, right? Same group, but the institutions, right? The following fall, that is, this fall. But there would be a bridging arrangement which would let the government get its shit together, right? Start introducing uh, the kind of honest administration uh, and, and clear plans. And they strike this agreement, they think, on February 20th, within a month of their election. In the meantime, they introduce humanitarian emergency measures, legislation, which they do not allow, for the first time in four years, they do not allow the representatives of the institutions who are sitting there in Athens, required under the memoranda to see every piece of legislation, they do not allow them to see the legislation. You know, they don't want to stick their finger in their eyes. They say, we don't have time. This is emergency legislation. We've got to get this into Parliament. And, you know, they do manage uh, to introduce some very basic measures of food and housing supply for the very poorest. They do bring back some of the employees laid off, including the famous women cleaners uh, at the finance department who've been camped out of the finance department. Uh, uh, for, I don't know, years, I guess. Uh, uh, the Europeans respond by, or the, the Troika, having agreed to this vaguely by continuing to dribble out the money. Uh, to dribble out in such a way uh, it's drip feeding, that this encourages further capital flight from Greece. <clears throat> Since December, with it being clear that Syriza was going to win, even if it wouldn't get a majority, uh, there, you know, there was a significant capital flight. By the end, it amounted to well over $30 billion. And the ECB has been keeping the Greek banks afloat from December on right through until this summer through emergency reserve lending on an overnight basis. Uh, what makes this even worse is that if a, a Greek uh, corporation, a multinational corporation, uh, a rich Greek family, and that's mostly where it's all coming from, of course, uh, there's not much of a run from you know, middle class or working class small bank accounts, interestingly. Uh, uh, when money goes, let us say, to the German Deutsche Bank or Commerce Bank from Greece, the arrangement under the international payment system is that that bank that receives it has to overnight lend to the bank that it's coming from an equivalent amount of money so that bank can balance its books the next day and remain solvent. But the arrangement is that it has to pay an interest to the German bank for lending it that money. So there's a double loss, if you like. It's a small rate of interest, but still, it's an additional loss. But what's really keeping them going is the ECB providing the uh, uh, Bank of Greece with these reserve funds with which it's keeping the Greek banks afloat. They're not making it easy for the ECB, however, uh, for the Bank of, of, of Greece to sell treasury bills for the Greek Department of Finance to fund the government. Of course, the only people who would buy these would be the Greek banks. 
and the ECB is uh, discouraging this. In some cases, making it impossible. So they're keeping the pressure up. You could say that the strategy that is being followed here by the Europeans is the Ramsey-McDonald strategy. It probably doesn't mean anything to any of you, and when I mentioned it to very highly politicized people in Greece, including Baltas, he didn't know what I was talking about. Ramsey-McDonald was the great leader of the Labour Party in Britain after Keir Hardy. In fact, he was seen as the intellectual of the Labour Party having written a book called Socialism and Society in 1906, which really very clearly lays out the Fabian position that uh, the Labour Party is not in favor of class struggle, it's opposed to class struggle, it's in favor of class harmony. And it will educate the ruling class to socialism. It will bring the two classes together. Right? And it's on that basis, by the way, that the Labour Party is never admitted to the Second International. Because you know, the German Social Democratic Party is full of Marxian language, of, despite the fact that it's becoming more and more reformist uh, uh, by this time, by 1906, etc., as Rosa Luxemburg points out in the mass strike. Um, MacDonald was elected, uh, and became leader of the Labour Party after Hardy, and he was elected the first socialist prime minister of Britain in 1924, brought down within a few months because of a forged letter in the British media from Zinoviev to MacDonald, which is purports to show that he's a secret Bolshevik. In 1929, he gets elected again. There's a minority Labour government right at the beginning of the Depression. And uh, they administer under the conditions of the gold standard, which is identical to the euro in that you cannot devalue under the gold standard, right? You have to impose austerity in order to deal with your balance of payments deficit. McDonald does this for two years. Finally, he cuts unemployment relief. The party revolts, and McDonald kicks away the party. He forms a national unity government with the conservatives, with him as prime minister, and with his uh, chancellor of the exchequer, his finance minister, Snowden as finance minister. Immediately, that national unity government goes off the gold standard. And Snowden says, nobody told us we could do this. Very famously. And MacDonald became a broken figure and took the Labour Party 14 years until it got re-elected again in 1945 with the famous majority government of 1945 under Attlee, etc. So it's arguable that what was going on was a McDonald strategy. Everybody recognized Cyprus' great popularity. And the more they went with Varoufakis as two highly charismatic figures, and let me tell you, Varoufakis is much more uh, uh, charismatic than Dragasakis, uh, certainly to the internet media television stage. Right? Uh, and, and they were standing up to the Europeans. This enervated Greek opinion. And they went up and up and up in the opinion polls. Right? So the strategy was, can we hold on to Tsipras? Varoufakis is just a blowhard you know, uh, academic that we can get rid of. We do need to get rid of him. This guy comes in here lecturing us like a Marxist economist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Right? <laughs> Who the hell does he think he is? Right? You think we're idiots? Uh, he's telling us, you know, all these uh, uh, post-Keynesian theories. Uh, uh, but Tsipras is a politician, and we can hope that he'll kick away Syriza. I think that was their hope and strategy. Still maybe. But there was another strategy going on from the factions inside the party, and that was to treat Tsipras as Kerensky. You know, the, uh, the February Revolution happened in 1917, the Democratic Revolution. Uh, finally, you get an accountable 
a parliament in, this, in, in Russia, which you haven't had since 1905, of course, when the first parliament is set up, this leads to the first revolutionary outbreaks, uh, etc. Uh, and clearly, the Bolshevik strategy all along is this, and, and they do see Kerensky as a paper tiger. Right? And with the support and the popularity they have in the Soviets, through the course of the summer of 1917, by October, they overthrow Kerensky. Right? There's this uprising. Uh, and they take the Winter Palace, etc. Well, in my view, the left platform, maybe not entirely thinking in these terms, but implicitly in these terms, right. is looking for an opportunity. Because I think they rationally and rightly see the naivete of bargaining stronger with the Europeans. This isn't going to work. Lapovitsas, uh, at the time, but it's the same time that, it's very interesting actually, all these economists uh, educated in Britain, uh, Lapovitsis actually has a job teaching at SOAS. Uh, 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 Tsakalatos did his PhD with Glynn at Oxford and taught for a long, long time in Britain. Uh, uh, Varoufakis, I think, did his PhD at Essex, if I'm not mistaken. Then went to teach at the University of Sydney, you know, always kept a foot in Greece, etc. Was, was actually teaching in Texas uh, uh, when all of this was going on very close to James Galbraith. Um, uh, it's very interesting, all these external Greeks, right, uh, economists are operating here. Lapovitsis publishes a book in 2012 calling for getting out of the Eurozone. It's a powerful argument. Right? What we want to do cannot be done in the Eurozone. The only problem with it, it has no politics. Right? It has no basis for what is the political basis for this given the balance of forces in the country. Right? It has no politics in terms of the geostrategic implications if they were kicked out of the European Union. Right? After all, this is a member of NATO. The European Union is the economic material base of NATO in that region. Right? Uh, the CIA probably still has its largest base in Europe, in Athens, especially given what's going on in the Mediterranean zone. Uh, so, you know, there's no politics to this. There's no politics to the left platform call, if you like, even though it's probably right. Okay, that's, that's the grounding. That's the, the situation that brings us to where we are. Because what you have is an immobilized movement all through the spring of this year. These tremendous movements are sitting there doing nothing. The Saudi networks are still operating, right? but that's all. There's nothing in the streets. There's this, this movement of subversion that's supposed to be lighting a fire under the rear ends of the government. Where are they? Right. Uh, even worse, there is an immobilized international left. A key premise of the whole strategy is that there will be a shift in the balance of forces in Europe, which will create the conditions whereby the arguments that Varoufakis is making will lead at least the social democrats in Europe, in Germany, in Scandinavia, in France, and the labor movement behind them to come in behind and support this. None of this happens. Yes, there's movement in Spain around the demos, around the local elections, the regional elections, and so on. But, you know, and, you know Sinn Féin is lo looking good in the polls in Ireland. This is small potatoes, as far as the Europeans are concerned. This is the periphery. Right? And what is astonishing, what is disgusting, you know, but tragic, is what's going on in the social democracy and the labor movements, and even the European <laughs> parties, which is nothing. At best, nothing. At worst, what the German social democrats are saying and doing, uh, which is you know, viciously anti-Syrism. 
But where, there, where is the street demonstration? You know, the marginal left in London organizes a demo. Right. Uh, but the, and the Scandinavian labor movement, the labor movement of Esping Anderson's dreams, where is it? Silent at worst. In fact, the Scandinavians are quite disdainful of the lazy Greeks, even though they spend more hours at work than Scandinavians and Germans. Hmm. So that's immobilized. But there's also, in a deeper sense, an immobilized government. As Baltas told me when I interviewed him in May, that interview was published in Jacobin a few weeks ago. We have done nothing to change the state. And he just led out, by the way, of course, he was trying to pass a piece of legislation that was important, right? uh, which was very admirable in terms of rejecting this bullshit on excellence, which allows for the corporatization and privatization of universities, not in any sense deriding the legislation he was trying to pass, but in terms of trying to change the apparatus of the largest state in the Greek state. He admitted, we haven't changed it. And he said, we're waiting, right? Uh, and, and one of the things he let slip was, we can't even make up our budget not knowing if we're going to get the European funds that we normally rely on for the education and culture budget. Right? And you begin to think, yeah, there's a lot going on here that you don't think about. Right? He himself is now walking around the corridors of the education ministry, now on the outskirts of Athens because it's the old building which, where the Olympic uh, Committee headquarters was, and they had to put something into it after the Olympics. So they moved the Department of Education in there. Uh, he walks around freely in the corridors of, of the department. This is unheard of. Ministers always walked around with guards around them. Right? When, you know, they, they invite schools to come in and do presentations and plays, and the minister comes down and talks to them, etc. He goes to schools unannounced, gives them a Marxist lecture on Greek history, he doesn't tell them it's Marxist, right? Tells the teachers, I can't give you any money, but if you use the school as a base to try to change social relations in the community, you'll have my support. But how can he do this at one meeting a week at an individual school? It all comes to a head then in June, where they can't pay both pensions and salaries and the IMF payment that's due. Tsakalatos, in his book, if you read it, says that George Papandreou exaggerated the problem by saying they wouldn't be able to pay pensions and employee salaries. He didn't. And they decide not to pay the IMF. And they come finally forward with the proposal, there's a payment to the European Union due, and they come forward with the proposal, a final proposal, and they're negotiating clearly within the bounds of European neoliberalism, but they have their red lines. And the most important red line is what they promised and what I read to you, that the first thing we will do will be to restore collective bargaining rights. That's our basic red line. And then they also introduce a budget, which will yield, yes, a surplus, which will help pay the debt. Right? But that will be done by raising taxes, raising corporation tax to 29%, introducing a 12% one-time only tax on profits uh, in the coming year. Uh, and yes, raising the value-added tax, but keeping the tax on basic food, reducing it from 8% to 6%. This is progressive within the framework of trying to negotiate right, how to simply a bridging to get to negotiating a new agreement in the fall. And if you ever want to see class struggle on a piece of paper, what was leaked was the institution's response to this. With red lines crossed out. The corporation tax is reduced from 29% to 28%. The one-time only 12% tax on profits is eliminated. And it is compensated for 
by raising the tax on food from 6 to 13 percent. Now, that is treated by most of the left, right, uh, and by everyone in Greece, as ideological. These guys are neoliberals. Yes, of course. But really, it's just a matter of capitalist accounting. A technocrat can quite right, the accountant can rightly say, I'm, I'm not ideological. Look, you don't know what a 12% tax on profits is going to yield in the middle of this depression. I don't know that's going to yield you enough that you're claiming in the budget, in this prospective budget. I know that a 13% tax on food, which people have to eat, right, that is going to yield a certain amount. I'm not being ideological. I'm being an accountant. So they call a referendum. Remember, Papandreou didn't call the referendum. Cyprus is going to show, and he does this against Dragosak, is pleading with him not to do it. He is going to show that he believes in democracy. And he's going to show the Europeans that they have the people behind them. <clears throat> and it unleashes this immobilized movement. Everybody except the Communist Party right, joins together. Antarcia, all of the solidarity networks, etc., mobilizes all of the series of capacities of, of political uh, education and organization, and they get this unbelievable Oki vote. Right? Oki having a tremendous resonance because it was the word that was used to refuse the Mussolini invasion in 1940, right? So it has incredible resonance, and they win it. Even though the ECB, during the campaign, cuts off the, the, any increase in the reserve funds to the Bank of Greece, which means that the banks don't have enough money to pay out any withdrawals and capital controls are introduced during the campaign. You would think that people, you know, all that shit about people lining up inside, outside of the ATMs, etc. It was largely media hysteria. People were quite calm. It's remarkable, right? Nevertheless, winning it in the face of that kind of pressure, right? great victory. And, and astonishingly, what that victory leads, and Dragasaki's in the middle of the campaign on the Tuesday night of that week, says we still might call it off. Because he's afraid of actually winning it. Immediately afterwards, all of the parties, all of the bourgeois parties, PASOK, etc., join behind Syriza in saying we support the proposal that Syriza made that was rejected by the institutions. And they're going to have an agreement they finally hammered out with the institutions after the referendum the following weekend. And in order to show them that it's got support for, for that initial proposal that was rejected, they present elements of that proposal in the Greek parliament on the Friday. Something strange happened. All of a sudden, the left starts screaming betrayal. This is before the negotiations have started for presenting that original proposal back to Parliament. The left platform clearly decided, and it started doing it so through its voices in the media, here, outside as well, right, are screaming betrayal against Cyprus for, for being Kerensky for not using the, the referendum right, as a basis to break with Europe, to make the move. Right. Of course, things get even worse over the weekend. Schauble comes to the meeting, the right-wing Greek finance, uh, German finance minister, and says, look, if he's got that kind of support from the Greek people, this shows it isn't just them we're dealing with. This isn't just a matter of getting Varoufakis from around the table, which they've gotten him out of the way since the end of April, right? And he's replaced by Tsakalatos, who's less flamboyant. Same ideas, but less flamboyant. Uh, uh, 
that's not the problem. The problem is the Greek people. And he says, let's get them out of here. You know, we can't have Greece in a Eurozone where we want the Euro to be essentially the same as the Deutschmark. Right? The basis for German exports. Right? He comes to that meeting astonishingly. Maybe not astonishingly, they should have seen it coming, because he had said before to Varoufakis, how much do you want to get out? The Social Democrats, Hollande, etc., had come to that meeting thinking that they would be able to win now more room for maneuver for the Greeks. Instead, that meeting was all about how do we bridge the differences between Schobel wanting to get them out and us wanting to stay them, keep them in with a form of words. And the form of words are more draconian than any IMF structural adjustment program of the 1980s in Latin America. That was what, was, that, what it cost to keep Greece in. At five in the morning, Tsakalatos and Tsipras decided to accept. They decided to accept because they didn't have a banking system a functioning banking system they hadn't prepared for. Uh, Tsipras comes back and says this is a terrible deal. It's horrible. It's humiliating. Uh, what we did manage to win is that this is at least a third memorandum. That is, they've given us the largest loan in world history. Yes, we'll have to do these humiliating things. Uh, although he implies they won't do some of them right, when push comes to shove. And he says it isn't going to work anyway. All this will do is drive us further into depression. We won't be able to pay it off anyway. Nevertheless, this is what we have to do. Right? He avoids calling a central committee meeting. He loses his <clears throat> support from the left platform in parliament. He has to now rely on the votes of PASOK and New Democracy in Parliament in order to pass the required legislation in this memorandum to start getting the money coming. Right. He's afraid to call a central committee meeting because he's not sure he has support, let alone from the left platform, but from the majority of the central committee. Everybody I was there, I was talking to the most long-standing stalwarts, uh, people not in the left platform, angry, didn't know how they would face the people in their party branch. The, the woman who leads the Federation of Solidarity Network said to me, I don't know whether to kill Cyprus or kill myself. So that was the sense, right? Not from people who were negotiating to get rid of Cyprus, right? That was the sense. Finally, he calls a central committee meeting, he promises a party congress before he calls an election. And he thinks he'll sweep an election because even after signing the memorandum, his popularity has gone up. It, is, it appears that Greeks understand that he stood up for them, that a gun was held to his head. Right. One woman I heard say in a market to an angry Pasok guy who said, you see, even they're signing the memorandum now. She said, from you I didn't take the memorandum, from him I'll take it. Okay, the polls are, the, a poll that's been leaked through Michael Spurdelakis, my former student, and it's a very reliable poll, not by series of people, by really technocratic pollsters uh, who are proud of their polling agency. There are a lot of prostitute pollsters in Greece. Uh, is that Syriza is at 28%. Although it has been shown that the margin is 1%, and new democracy is barely at 23. They are even now? No. Now, the latest one. This is as of, as of yesterday. yesterday yes. As of yesterday. Uh, this is the leaked poll. Golden Dawn has 8%, which means it'll be the third party, but that's where it was last time pretty well. So it was 6%. 6, 6 so it's gone up by 2 then. Uh, uh, the Communist Party still is at its usual about 5%. Because of signing the memorandum, in other words, it's recovered a lot of its base, which it might have lost for having opposed the yes vote. 
having abstained from referendum. Popular Unity, the party that La Fanzanis and the left platform have formed, uh, is at 3%. And Anel, the right-wing party that joined in the government, is at 3%. And both of those, therefore, are in danger of not getting into parliament. They might. Right? That's very close. It's likely, then, Podami? that Cyprus about, will form... What about Potami? Uh, well, Potami is 6%. Very low. And Pasok is slightly higher, but not 8. 7, I think. Uh, Cyprus will get in. Uh, won't have a majority, probably. There's a better chance if, if neither Popular Unity or Anel get in with the 50% bonus that you get for having the plurality, 50 seat bonus, it's possible. If he gets 145 seats, he can form a stable government. If it's 130, he'll have to do a deal with Pasak. The greatest danger, the greatest fear, is that he'll do a deal with Potami, which are seen as the modernizers, the hated modernizers, the neo cynical neoliberal Blairites, etc. Although they didn't come out of, of Syriza. Um, but that's where things stand. I want to conclude, if you'll just give me five, I know I've been on so long, five more minutes with what Eric was asking for. Is it betrayal? I think saying so is cynical. It's sectarian. I'm angry with many of my uh, comrades who I've known for 40, 50 years in the international left for speaking in these terms. In Greece, I understand it better, people feeling this way. Uh, I think those of us outside need a little bit more modesty, given a little we're able to accomplish. Uh, is it proof that European democracy doesn't exist? A lot of the left is speaking in these terms, that Europe has ended democracy. No. This is extravagant. After all, a Slovakian government was defeated for lending money to Greece. You know, every European Eurozone country had to sign on to a certain amount right, in the bailout. Slovakia has the largest portion of the Greek debt relative to its GDP, although it's the smallest portion of the Greek debt. Right? It's a tiny country. Even, even Merkel had difficulty and wasn't able to carry the whole of her party in supporting this latest memorandum. Right? She had to rely on the votes of other parties right, to get it through. Right? So in the terms of what we know as ordinary capitalist democracy, yes, it's democracy. Right? Why should Greece's democracy count more than other? But what kind of democracy? Exactly. Nevertheless, I said in the ordinary terms of capitalist democracy, nothing has changed in that sense. When people say what's been proven is that Greece has lost its sovereignty, Greece didn't have its full sovereignty. In a certain sense, no member of the European any longer has full sovereignty. And in terms of my understanding of informal American empire, no country within its framework can be said to have its full sovereignty. This is extravagant language. And you would think that you know, serious Marxist sociologists and political scientists would be more careful in using such language. What it shows is what Eric was telling, talking about, the incredible dilemmas that such a government faces. Not because they didn't take these words seriously. They did. Right? I think on the whole, they believed them. Right? But given the dilemmas, they hadn't thought them through enough, strategically, theoretically, right? uh, to be able to cope with this. Uh, I think they were inevitably thinking because they weren't so naive, maybe less naive than the left platform, about the geostrategic implications. You know, to this day, the left platform will talk about going out of the Euro, but not out of the European Union. Now, what can you really do if you go out of the Euro and you need to rebuild a furniture industry? You need import controls in order to be able not to have this enormous deficit in your balance of payments, given that the drachma will be worth so little, right? 
can you actually stay within the European Union, which is a free trade zone? Don't you have to maintain capital controls? It's hard to stay in the European Union under such conditions. Well, what are the, what's the implications of that, especially if you were to turn to Putin for support? So that, you know, the security machinations within the framework of the American empire, especially what's getting, going on in the Middle East and in the Ukraine, right, this has got to be on their minds. Nobody talks about this. Okay. Yesterday, I found, although it came out a day, a day or two ago, that Varoufakis, uh, Mélenchon, the leader of the Front de Gauche in France, Zoe Constantopoulos, the Speaker of the Greek Parliament, who has left Syriza and uh, has not joined Popular Unity but is running in the election, allied with it, uh, and Lafontaine from uh, the Left Party and an Italian member of Parliament who I've never heard of, have issued a statement uh, called uh, a manifesto calling for breaking with austerity Europe, calling for a plan A and plan B, which would include civil disobedience to end uh, this irrational uh, uh, Euro strategy of the Europeans, and saying we will call an international conference where we'll consider a whole bunch of things that Varoufakis plays with, like alternate currencies, uh, electronic currencies, none of which can be done without states signing on in any serious way, but also to consider Grexit. Consider, he calls it Euro-exit, they call it Euro-exit. That's an interesting development, especially since the European left party's position, above all, the most important of those parties, the left party in Germany, the Linke. The position has been, and Cyprus was head of their ticket, that in order to compensate for neoliberal economic and monetary union, what we need is political and social union. In other words, what we need is a centralized fiscal budget. Well, that's further centralization that they've been calling for under the same balance of forces as exists now. This would leave less room for maneuver in any individual country where the balance of forces shifted, as in Greece, or should Podemos get in in Spain. This is actually a strategy that is extremely problematic further centralization. So this opens up all questions of what has been the strategy of the left vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Obviously, in any case, it's blown apart since it was the far left, the Trotskyist left, right, which was most oriented to internationalism, to the real struggle being at the European level. And now they're the ones who are mostly backing, getting out of the Eurozone. So everything's open. What this opens up for all of us is the question of reform and revolution all over again. The question of patience and impatience. Cyprus was impatient, rightly so, when he said we'll form a government with anybody. And that changed the political situation in Greece. Rightly so, to stop the torture. But being impatient when the party hadn't prepared the base for this dynamic, multi-dimensional movement of subversion, right, was very problematic. When the party hadn't attempted to encourage, create a cadre that could encourage, the planning for different forms of production and consumption of the type that Eric studies around the world, or that Joel's involved in trying to get going in one city after another across the United States, without linking that to the party, of course, so they aren't isolated little pockets, which is their problem as they exist now. Right? They aren't connected to any transformative strategy. Right? They're just examples. Right? They don't, don't have a politics. Right? That's the problem. And that needs a lot of patience. It needs a lot of time. I don't have an answer to this dilemma. I'll leave it there. Thanks. I'm sorry. I